Hi, my name is Dr. Philip Wilson. I'm uh, one of the orthopedic sports surgeons here at Scottish Rite, and I'm the medical director of sports medicine. Uh, we're so uh, happy that you uh, uh, engaged our uh, pediatric orthopedic uh, educational symposium, and uh, I'd like to talk to you about uh, common uh, causes of adolescent knee pain. Um, these are my disclosures. You know, we kind of find that the knee at times for people who aren't doing it every day is, is a little bit of a, of a black box. So there's, there's a lot of things that you start to think about when the knee gets in front of you. Sometimes you may not be as familiar as you'd like with the anatomy. And you, you know all of this list of diagnoses that, that sometimes you, you think could be in your differential, so it's a little confusing. But I'd like to present to you a little bit of an algorithm or a systematic way to think about that. What I'd like you to think about is breaking it down into some history uh, and physical findings that can really help you narrow down this list and, and really your history often will get you uh, pretty far as in most, most things to the diagnosis. Uh, so acute versus chronic presentation, effusion versus no effusion, and is it primarily a pain problem or is it primarily a motion abnormality? So. Uh, that's the system we're going to use, and we're going to just go ahead and start and go through this list with some of these scenarios and, and see what that does for us. So first of all, let's think about an acute problem. And from our list, that could be a sprain. It could be a contusion. Sometimes it's a ligament tear, a fracture in and around the knee, or, or maybe an injury to the cartilage in the knee. Now, if we think about the concept of a fusion. And a fusion, as you know, is a collection of fluid within the joint, not just soft tissue swelling, but in that joint. Um, and we, we say, okay, it's an acute problem, but there's not really an effusion. Their, their problem is right at the knee, but it's not one of those things. Well, a lot of our list gets, gets narrowed down pretty quick. So then we think about sprains or contusions. Uh, so pretty s small list. And then we say, okay, where's the pain? If the pain is kind of in the soft tissues following a stress exam, it's a sprain. If it's focal to, to, with palpation to the bone, then often a contusion or maybe soft tissue that's focal not to a ligament. So again, a ligament injury is a sprain. A muscle injury uh, can be a strain or a muscle strain. And then of course we know contusions can be bone, soft tissue, or some combination thereof. So you've got soft tissue swelling, not a lot of bony tenderness uh, with these sprains, and a negative x-ray. Um, and, and so then, you know, your ligament exam is pretty normal. They have some pain around the joint, but nothing focal. Again, no effusion. So we're going to assume that's a sprain or maybe even a contusion, and, and it's symptomatic treatment. Um, we've all heard of the RICE protocol. We, we sometimes add a P there for protect, so sometimes it's an ACE wrap or maybe even a splint or, or a brace, but certainly rest, ice, compression, elevation. We get, get them moving early uh, and try to get that strength restored. We don't necessarily need to see these folks unless those symptoms last for more than three or four weeks. If that pain is ongoing, we need to see them. So let's go back to our list. Now, let's say we've got an acute problem, but there is an effusion this time. And we're going to talk about that effusion in just a minute. But let's just say they're acute, and we've, we've learned to diagnose that effusion. Well, now we've got things like ACL tear or other intraarticular ligamentous injury, uh, a kneecap or a patellar dislocation, a tibial spine fracture, which we'll talk about a little bit, but that's a fracture inside the joint, or maybe an acute meniscal tear. So um, then, to narrow that list down, we have four or five categories there. Uh, then let's think about the motion that occurred. With patellofemoral dislocation, it's a twist and, and, and a pop, and the kids will tell you, my knee dislocated. They felt a big event. With an ACL tear, they'll say, my knee twisted and it popped, and it just kind of shifted. It didn't really dislocate. It just, and they'll show you sometimes, it just kind of moved. With a tibial spine fracture, it's often hyperflexion during sports or snow skiing. Classically, it was a fall from a bike, but as our kids' activity levels change, it may be more active sports, but a real hyperflexion injury. And then a meniscus can be a twisting event. So our first order of business in, in, in this sort of subgroup is, you know, how do we tell there's an effusion? And, and I think it's, it's not as daunting or as hard to tell the difference between an effusion and just soft tissue swelling if you really start to get the principles. So we're going to talk about the physical exam, but particularly here on this x-ray, look at that x-ray there. Look at this side view of the knee. Look at the kneecap as it was related to the thigh bone. And then look at the muscle 
coming off the kneecap and the space between the kneecap and the femur. I think there's kind of something right in there. So if we look at that, see I've traced around that with this red outline. And now if I remove that, you can kind of see that, that sort of curvilinear density that's it's not the linear muscle. It's not the deep muscle up here. It's not this fat pad, which is more radiolucent. It's this density right in here in the joint. So that's an effusion. And, and radiographically, once you see a big one, it's pretty easy to find. Now, this is a physical examination of an effusion. The knee that's on the right-hand side of your screen there is normal. You can see the concavities around the kneecap, but this left or this knee on your left, which is the patient's right, you can see how bulbous the soft tissues look. And the real cardinal sign there is that you've lost those concavities around the patella. You see sort of these bulges up here at the top, here and here, and you see that you've lost those concavities. Here's another example of, of a little bit of an active evaluation of a knee fusion, effusion. So you can see if there's not quite as much fluid, if we really press on that medial side of the knee, we've kind of pushed those tissues, and then we can move that fluid wave from lateral to medial. See me pressing the fluid to one side and then pushing on it. So these are the kind of hallmarks. You lose the concavities or there's actually swelling or fluid that you can move around. If that's soft tissue swelling and not fluid in the joint, you can't move it around. That soft tissue swelling may indent, but that fluid wave is a cardinal sign of an effusion. So now that we know how to diagnose an effusion, we got an acute event, we've got an effusion, now let's kind of talk about how we differentiate. Remember that patellar dislocation, that patient tells us something dislocated, my knee popped out of place. So they've got that effusion, they tell you that history, and then we have this physical exam that we call an apprehension sign. You see that in the center down there labeled apprehension sign. See how I'm pushing on the medial kneecap? And as I push that over, they get what we call apprehensive. They, they kind of almost will sit up. They'll kind of grab your arm. They feel apprehensive that you're going to dislocate their kneecap. The other thing that you can see sometimes is what we call a J sign. And we're going to show that a little bit later in the exam. But here's a patient who's got a really big J sign. You see as I flex the knee, you see how that kneecap jumps? So sometimes we think about the J sign as standing for jump. The patella jumps from out to in the groove. Or some people have referred to it as a J because it's kind of an upside down J sign. The kneecap goes from out and then it pops in. So you can see that exam finding of that loose kneecap. And again, if, you, if the patient's got their leg over the side of the table and they straighten their knee, you may see this kneecap jump like that. It jumps from out to in with that J sign. So if kids have had a patellar dislocation, you see maybe this little avulsion fracture where the ligament pulled off the inner side of the kneecap. They've got an apprehension sign. They've got a J sign. Then you want to refer those to us if they have all of those signs. And we're happy to see those anytime. So if we have that effusion and, and it didn't really, they don't say their knee dislocated, but just something popped and, and, and maybe something gave way, then we're thinking about maybe an, a ligament particularly the ACL. Remember, there are four ligaments, the two collateral, so medial and collateral on each side, and then the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament. So ACL is anterior cruciate ligament. And so when that ligament's torn, the knee has more motion. And so our, our patients will tell us their knee kind of slipped or gave out, but our examination is that Lachman exam. And you get, a lot of you guys have heard of that. Maybe you've, you didn't get to practice it much, but you learned it once. This is the Lachman exam. So what we do is we get the patient to relax. You can see specifically their hamstrings. We really need them to relax their hip, relax their hamstrings. We're gonna stabilize their thigh with, here with my left hand. We're moving the tibia forward with our right hand and you see that shift. And it's really a side to side comparison. You know that old joke about orthopedists um, having it easy because we have another side to compare to is, is really kind of true. So, because you take this exam and you compare it to the other side. What I want you to notice is this boy is the boy that had the effusion that we saw earlier, and now you can see when we shift that tibia, he's got a lot of motion, and that's because that ACL, that rope is torn. So if you have this suspicion, if you have that MRI picture, if you have that effusion or that instability, particularly with a Lachman, uh, go ahead and send those patients to us for, for evaluation and treatment. 
Now, a tibial spine fracture, pop, effusion, usually a pretty big effusion, which is a hemarthrosis, blood in the joint, because this is a fracture. Again, a little bit younger kids often, a flexion event with skiing or sports or fall from a bicycle, and they had a pop. And here, you're going to see on the x-ray, you're going to see this fragment. It looks like something, a little bit of trash sitting down there between the thigh bone and the shin bone. And so that often is a little fracture where the ACL is attached to the bone. And at this age, instead of the ACL tearing in the middle of the rope, it pulled that piece of bone. And so if we have this, this is often an operative problem because we need to go back and put that piece of bone in place or maybe move the knee and get it in a cast if it's in a good position. So tibial spine fracture. And then finally, not all meniscal injuries have a big effusion, but they can. So a twist, a pop, and they just have joint line pain. It just hurts on the side of their joint, um, really focal to the side of their joint. Their Lachman's negative. They don't have that, that uh, patellar apprehension. Uh, they don't have anything positive on their x-rays, but they're real tender on their joint line. That may be an acute meniscus tear. Uh, so again, maybe a need for an MRI. If that effusion is there, there's often an internal derangement that needs to be treated. And so that's kind of our top diagnoses and the way to think about it. Now, if we move back to our algorithm and we move away from acute injuries for a moment here and we say chronic injuries. So now our list could be, could be a stress fracture that's been sore for a while. It could be apophysitis, so pain at a growth plate. Patellofemoral pain, which is just kind of pain around the kneecap that doesn't have a specific injury, or what we call an OCD, or osteochondritis dissecans, which we'll touch on. So if you have chronic pain, these are the things we're thinking about. These don't have an effusion generally, okay? And then we say, okay, where is the pain? So with a stress fracture, they're usually point tender over a pretty small area around a bone, Apophysitis, they're definitely focally tender. Patellofemoral pain, they're specifically not focally tender. They have diffuse pain, they cannot put a finger on it. And then OCD, they don't even try to go around their kneecap. They just say, I don't know, it's somewhere deep in my knee. They're often a little bit less focused on the front of their knee uh, and they just say it's down deep. So these are activity-related knee pains, okay? Remember these diagnoses, stress fracture, apophysitis, patellofemoral pain, OCD, these are activity related. Now, with this guy, I really want you to not forget to think about the hip, okay? So when adolescents have activity related knee pain, often no inciting event, maybe they're limping a little bit, maybe they're a little heavier, their foot's turned out a little bit, boy, don't, think, don't forget about that slipped capital femoral epiphysis. You will not miss that if you always do a hip rotational exam. So if you start your knee exam with rotation of the hip and they have equal symmetric range of motion, you're not going to forget that skiffy. You're not going to miss it and you can go on to these diagnoses. Okay, so stress fracture. Usually they've been on the couch all summer. It's in the first month or so back to sports. They're running, they're doing a lot of activities. They're focally tender on the bone. Their knee joint is okay. Distal femur, stress fracture, you can see it on the x-ray. Often it may look a little worrisome to you, but the radiologist and combining that radiologist opinion with a history of high activities like running, a stress fracture is pretty high in your differential and you can refer that and it's usually not a pathologic lesion. Again, activity related, pain in the front of the knee. They may say, oh, I'm pain right here in the front of my knee and I make them point to it. And if they point and then I push either on that tibial tubercle, which is Osgood Slaughter's apophysitis, or on the inferior pole of the patella, which is Sinden, Larson, Johansson, three people got their name on that. So that's patellar apophysitis. That's the diagnosis. So focally tender, activity related, only pain in that one place, and the growth plate is going through that transition with a lot of stress applied in that area with activities. Usually this is rest, anti-inflammatories, quad stretching, and reassurance that it will get better. Patellofemoral pain, unlike Sinden Larson Johansson or SLJ for patellar apophysitis, Osgood Slaughter's for that tibial tubercle spot, patellofemoral pain, they cannot pinpoint it, okay? They give us what we call a horseshoe sign. 
See that little cartoon on that knee? That's because that's what she does when you ask her to point to her pain. It's all around. She can't, she says, it's just all around here. It's all around my knee. And a lot of times kids may have this appearance. They may be a little bit less conditioned in their muscle tone. Uh, sometimes they have a little bit of uh, in towing. They have got a little bit of knock knees. And that really is kind of the hallmark. This, they're not having instability of their knee, but they have pain around their kneecap. And that tends to be soft tissue insertional pain around the kneecap, stress in the bone. We don't know exactly why this happens, but we think it has some uh, 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 sort of caused by an, an abnormal balance of the homeostasis of the muscle strength around the front of the knee. So when we've looked at this problem, we've looked at things like icing, bracing, acupuncture, um, shoe wear changes, um, all kinds of other treatments that you can think of. The one thing that works is physical therapy. Quadricep strengthening, knee balance, knee proprioceptive strengthening. So physical therapy is the answer for patellofemoral syndrome. OCD. Okay, sometimes this is a really strange diagnosis to people. This is an idiopathic osteonecrosis below the cartilage surface during development that if it continues leads to cartilage surface cracks and instability of a surface lesion on the joint. So when we see this, what we want to do is think about that patient complaining of knee pain, can't localize it, no effusion, chronic, Let's get an x-ray. Let's make sure the x-ray looks normal. And so if the x-rays, and specifically that notch view, looks normal, and you don't see this little radiolucent lesion, that's definitely concerning for an OCD when you see it. If your x-rays are completely normal, you can go back to those other diagnoses. Um, so again, OCD, abnormal x-ray, and chronic, um, non-injury related, non-effusion related knee pain. Okay, so an OCD, the younger they are, the more likely they are to heal. The smaller they are, the more likely that they are to heal. And if they're stable, meaning the MRI doesn't show a crack, it's not split. So those are the things that we look at when you send us an OCD to decide whether they need immobilization, maybe a brace, sometimes they need surgery. But when you see these OCDs, send them our way. We're happy to see them, and we can kind of help provide some clarity and a, and a good treatment plan for the family. Okay, back to our injury list. So now we're going to talk about chronic. Again, we've talked about the chronic, no effusions. But now instead of pain, that whole other list was just pain. Now let's say they've got a motion abnormality. Let's say they've got a chronic knee pain, no effusion, but their knee pops and it just kind of pops and maybe they've got some joint line symptoms, that's a discoid meniscus or a symptomatic discoid meniscus. They'll say their knee pops or snaps, they have pain at the joint line or that motion abnormality directed at the joint line. And this is pretty common. One or two out of every 100 kids have it. It's a congenital malformation of the meniscus. Instead of the meniscus being shaped like a boomerang, it's shaped like a Frisbee. And when kids are on that all the time, it begins to split and tear, and that leads to instability of that meniscus. And so when you see that, oops, I'm sorry, when you see that in young kids, you can even see the meniscus popping in the knee. You see that bulge at the lateral joint line. And this snapping knee between the ages of two and six is very common. Between six and 10, they may present with just a knee that they can't straighten anymore. Again, painless, no injury. As kids get older, it presents like a regular meniscal tear. So if you see this, if you encounter that, that limp or loss of extension or that snapping knee, think about that meniscus in that chronic non-effusion knee. So again, we, we like to see those kids, counsel the family about treatment. A lot of times, because it's a mechanical internal problem, they need surgery. Now, let's try to put all that physical exam findings that we went through together. Let's look at this exam. Um, here's our patient. We're going to start out. They're sitting on the edge of the table. This is where we can look at that kneecap exam, that kneecap instability. So she's flexing, extending. We're watching the way the kneecap tracks. We're watching for that J sign. Now we're going to put her supine. We're kind of looking at her knee extension. We're looking at her. Now what are we doing? We're 
checking her hip range of motion. Okay, first part of your knee exam. We wanna make sure that her hips rotate symmetrically, both internal and external. Remember, if we get her knees together and we're gonna bring her feet out, remember that's internal rotation of the hip when the feet come out. So if they internally rotate symmetrically, she does not have a skiffy. Now we're gonna talk about the knee. Now let's say, okay, where is your knee pain? Look at that, what do you guys think? She gave us a little, oh, that's kind of that horseshoe sign, right? She, I said, point to the one spot where your knee hurts. Well, let's think about this. She did not have a J sign, and now I'm checking that apprehension sign. I'm moving that kneecap around. She's not sitting up. She's not all that bothered or worried about it. You can see I'm kind of white knuckling that, and she's not got a lot of pain. So she's got peripatellar kneecap pain, but she does not have an apprehension sign. So now, you know, we've already got a patient. We can see those concavities. We know she doesn't have a knee effusion. She can't localize it. She gives us the horseshoe sign. Her knee is stable. She doesn't have an apprehension sign. There we were checking the Lachman exam. Now we're checking her collateral ligaments. We're, again, we're just going back to check that kneecap. And what do you guys think? I mean, you guys now know we're pretty far down the road. This is patellofemoral pain most likely. Now, we may need an x-ray to make sure there's not an OCD, but you know, if we have a normal x-ray, the history that she gave us and these exam findings, she says, nope, it's not joint line pain. Nope, it doesn't hurt when you push my joint line and rotate my tibia to check the meniscus. It didn't hurt when you did that Lachman exam on my knee. Lateral meniscus doesn't hurt. So we've, we've really got a nice exam here for, for anterior patellofemoral pain. But you can see all these, and you guys can, can replay that video. You can look at um, those Lachman tests that we did, um, kind of walk through that physical exam that we did, uh, kind of a step-by-step. -step. We're going to check. That's where you check for sendon larsen johansons This is where you check for tibial tubercle apophysitis or osgood slaughters Again, both of those sites of apophysitis, no pain. Again, now we're just checking around where she actually does have pain. And she says, no, you can't put your finger on it. It just hurts there when I'm active. So now let's see how she moves. So she can squat. She doesn't have any pain in her joint line when she moves. Now look at those legs. She's got a little bit of valgus um, when she squats. Now watch this knee control when she bends down for us. She's got a little bit of tough control there. And now look at that. She's having a little trouble controlling that knee. Now our friend here, she's grown a lot, right? She's a young lady. She's been doing a lot of growing. That thigh muscle just, I mean, that thigh bone recently got a lot longer, but those muscles have to kind of, kind of get stronger to keep up. And right now she's got a muscle imbalance where her lever arms of the bones are, are longer than her muscle strength is able to control. And so she has that anterior knee pain. So again, I, I think with this system, I really hope maybe you need some, some times through this talk, but I hope that by breaking it down into acute chronic, effusion, no effusion, pain or motion abnormality, you can really kind of get some organization to your knee exam. We've made a handout that really lists these diagnoses by effusion or no effusion. It gives us key mechanism of injury, history and physical findings and kind of what our usual treatment is. So we really hope that this kind of algorithm of care in conjunction with this handout can really help you organize your knee exam or your thoughts around your, your knees that you're thinking about referring. So again, um, at Scottish Rite, we're, we're thrilled uh, to have you guys as partners. We're happy to see patients on it, either our Dallas campus or our Frisco campus. This is a, our Frisco campus where we do our sports and. Uh, a lot of our fracture work and also some of our other orthopedic outpatient care. Um, you can see we've got a lot of resources here. It's a beautiful campus. We'd love to have you guys come visit us anytime. These are our contact uh, information, uh, and so please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you very much.